Well, Gospel of John, chapter uh, 15, pick it up at verse uh, uh, 25 of uh, 14. Gospel of John, chapter 14, it says here, These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave you with. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives, do I give to you, but let not your heart be troubled, neither, be, neither let it be afraid. You've heard me say uh, to you, I'm going away and coming back. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk uh, much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. So this this time that he's having this uh, supper uh, with his disciples, uh, Judas has already departed. Now he's telling his uh, guys, let's get up, let's arise, let's go. And again, when you read chapters 13, uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17, and hopefully you're reading those throughout the week and you can get this whole in context, this is his last 24 hours uh, before being offered up and to be uh, charged and to be uh, seven illegal trials uh, and all the miscarriage of justice, but yet it was part of God's plan, as Isaiah tells us, it was the Father's good pleasure to crush the Son that you and I could have this salvation. And Jesus, again, was, was, as we go, uh, as we continue through our study, we'll see him as he uh, pours out his heart to the Father in the garden there. But he says, let's arise and let's go. And in chapter 15, so from the Mount of Olives, where they're at, they're probably over there, and they're, and they're coming, that's on the east side of the temple, and there's a, a, a bridge that goes across from the Gethsemane, or the Mount of Olives area there, to the temple, and it goes right through the gate beautiful, or the eastern gate. And that gate to this day is sealed up. It's not actually the gate that we see sealed up on the eastern side of the, of the wall of the Temple Mount area. It's actually further down, probably about another 70 to 100 feet, quite possibly, or somewhere around there. But it's all been buried over or covered over with the various uh, graves that are there. Uh, but Hadrian, the emperor, emperor of Rome, sealed it up because he heard of the prophecy that the Messiah is going to come through that gate. So he sealed it up. Like it's really going to stop him. But we know that uh, when Jesus comes back uh, triumphantly and to reign and rule for that thousand years, that he's going to come through, through over from the Mount of Olives, step his foot on there, and this great uh, earthquake is going to happen, and it's just going to split wide open, and he's going to go up on the Temple Mount area. But on that gate beautiful, there are some vines, and vines are representative of the nation of Israel. Jesus, again, is going on to say another I am statement. We already seen in John chapter 6 what he says. I am that bread of life. What did he say in John chapter 1? I am that light. And we know that he says, I am that light. I am that bread. I am that rock in that wilderness that was smitten. I am that living water. I, I'm the one that gives sight to the blind. And now he says, I am the true vine. And so when you're... Walking through with us, if you go this to Israel, or you see that you look at this gate, you see that there's vines there. And it was all, and the one great vine that was decorative there was huge. And everyone could see that, and it was representative of the nation of Israel. Now Jesus, again, he says, rise, let's go. And they're walking by this, most likely, or you can see it from a great distance anyways. And I am the true vine. And my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now this word ario in the, in the Greek, and also the Hebrew equivalent there, of this take away means to lift up. It means that he's going to lift up. There are branches that aren't bearing fruit that are, again, uh, hanging low or whatever, and you would lift them up. It's interesting when we go to Israel, we see self-picking cherry trees. Their English doesn't really translate over well, and you'll see it on the maps, and you're like, well, let's go see that. Let's go see some self-picking cherry trees. There's signs all over the place, and I understand you get to go to the farm and pick your own cherries like that, but the signs are self-picking cherry trees. And when you go there, at certain times of year, they're all bound up, and my wife goes, wow, they really must pick a lot on each other, because they bind them all up, and they just hold them right there. And we're like, yeah. So for us, it's just, it's just kind of cute. It's just kind of cute to... Going on there. If you want to know what that's like, just talk to Alexi in the back there. His English and just how he translates and things just come across in the translation. I just, I just laugh, and he's just, 
And he doesn't understand why we're laughing, because I just because it's funny what you just said. And he's the worst customer service. Normally they let you down easily and they say, you know, well, I need some more information, stuff like that. He just goes, I can't help you, and walks away. <laughs> now, he's not being mean, he literally can't help them and just walks away. And all right. Hopefully, in a few more years that he's living here, he'll learn how to be tactful and diplomatic and manipulative like the rest of the Minnesotans <laughs> and make people feel good, but still not help them. <laughs> Maybe you can go work for Microsoft. All right. He says, I am the true vine. The other thing is that is that there's this great menorah also. It's the only light that is given in the Holy of the Holies. And it's this menorah, this seven candlestick, this arbor, that's supposed to be beaten out of one piece of solid gold. And it's, to be, and it's the only thing in the Holy of Holies that gives light in that area. And again, you read the temple there. And that's the, also the same thing, is that the, the main vine is what really gives oil to others. So there's this one in the middle there, oil goes in that, and it feeds to all the other branches. So there's a double entendre here. Yes, he is that true vine. You're looking at this gate right there. But then he goes on to be more poignant about that light. That light that's representative in the temple. The only light that's in there, inside that where the holies, the holies are, uh, is that's what's giving light. He says here, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. He takes away, but he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, if you think about it, there's the, the pruning, there's, there's some clipping that goes on. So you can look at the analogy, even in our, individually, in our own lives. If we're bearing fruit, there's going to be some more pruning. There's going to be some more cultivating going on there. And so it could be painful at, at sorts. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. As we go on this morning, I want you to understand two words. There is, a, there is position and there is relationship. You've got to understand your position in Christ and your relationship in Christ. And I want you to understand here, chapter 15, I believe with all my heart, is to believers. That you have to understand something. That it, it, to a non-believer, to someone who does not have a relationship with God, you're not going to understand these things. Jesus says these things are spiritually discerned, and you're going to understand them. But understand this. He says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. What, what is that which makes us clean? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. Is it something that we've done? Okay, nowhere in Scripture are you commanded, okay, I want you to understand this, nowhere in Scripture are you commanded uh, to uh, be clean. In other words, it's that, it's that position that it's He who is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, He talks about cleansing ourselves from the impurity, but that has to do something more with the relationship. But the cleaning action, in 1 John 1, 9, remember, whenever you get a new Bible, open that up, make sure it's there. Make sure it's there. For He's faithful and just to cleanse us. If we confess our sins, what? He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I had someone show me a time, a Bible, that it didn't have it in there. There's a Bible bookstore that's out of business now for good reasons, but they were selling Bibles at 30 and 40% off because some pages were missing. He goes, check this out. It's actually not there. And they still sold you the Bible? Well, at a discount. Wow, man. All these misprints. And so... So I advise you, when you're buying a Bible, make sure 1 John 1, 9 is there, that you know that you're cleansed. But who's faithful and just to cleanse us? And what cleanses us? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Now, this is relationship. No, nowhere are you commanded or so that you have to abide in Jesus Christ. See, so understand this. One, positionally, I am cleansed and clean by Jesus Christ. But abiding... This is sometimes where people get really confused. They think, well, then you can lose your salvation. You can be out of fellowship. I can. Can you and I? I? I think we're all in good company here today. Can we be out of fellowship with the Lord? Yes. We need to continually abide. I believe in once saved, always saved, as long as you abide in Christ. Do you understand there that this is positionally that Jesus Christ saves us, but yet I can be out of fellowship. And that abiding has to deal with a relationship. And that's, again, continually what we see throughout God's Word. We see the first recorded case of religion, right? Genesis, Adam and Eve, what do they do? They covered themselves with fig leaves. And what did God say to them? That's not good enough. That ain't going to do. That's not good. And then what he did, because of the relationship he has with them, what did he do? He clothed them. So one, positionally, I'm clean because of what Jesus Christ has done. And I've atoned that. I've accepted that. I've received that. I've chosen that free gift that God offers. 
but I need to abide. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. This is where the world really takes us to task and tries to take us to task. Well, I can do things. I can walk. I can talk. I can pat my head, and I can run with somebody at the same time. There's a lot. That's not what we're talking about here. There's physically things that you can do, but we're talking about those things that matter for eternal life that deal in this relationship. And so here, apart from me, you can do nothing. You are the vine. Understand this. The source is from the vines. You don't look at the branches and go, man, that's, it, it's the roots. It's the vine. It's the main foundation that actually produces the fruit. What do the branches do? Listen up, Christian. What do the branches do? Listen up, Christian. You and I are the branches. As my friends say in Chicago, the branches. We bear the fruit. I've never seen, even the self-picking cherry trees in Israel, even all this stuff, I've never seen a branch straining to produce fruit. It comes from that seed. It comes from that vine. It comes from that, that root. And it comes up, and that's all the branch does is bear the fruit. I know what type of a tree it is because I see the fruit. But understand this. Positionally, I'm clean in Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not bearing fruit, what does the first part tell us? Well, he's going to lift up. He's going to lift those things up. He's going to lift them up. He's going to hold us up, which he does. I mean, we can see that. We see that the characteristic of, of God all the way through the Bible. Always holding people up. In fact, he tells us in Romans 15, 1, to what? To bear up with the failings of the weak. To bear them, to hold them up. And here's the thing, as my pastor told me a long time ago, there's no time limit. I was getting frustrated, bearing up with the failings of the weak. Oh, woe is me. There's all these weak people I've got to bear up with. And the pastor got a hold of me, gave me a Holy Spirit gut check. He says, Chick, it says right here, Proverbs 15, 1. Yeah. Or um, Romans 15, 1. What does it say? It says, to bear up with the failings of the weak. He says, yeah. He says, show me where the time limit is. What? Yeah, show me where the time is. Show me where you're supposed to stop. There's up to a certain point. I looked. I was looking. You see, because I had interpreted that, that I can only bear up the feelings for the week for so long. And then I played the human card. I'm only human. Do you realize that we're all human? Well, when people say that, well, I'm, I'm human. I've said that. It encourages me when I hear others say it, like, wow, is that what I sounded like? <laughs> encourages me. Okay, I'm growing. All right, but we're all human. Do you understand that's why there's not salvation for the animals? I believe cats are in heaven. I do. I do. That's what they make the strings for the harps out of. I, I believe they're there. All right. There's got to be horses because we come riding on horses. You're going to come back in that millennium. Two things. Get some horse riding lessons and learn some Hebrew so you're not a tourist when you come back. But you understand this is that he says you're, you're abiding in me as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Here's the other thing that I've realized of this. The fruit doesn't eat itself. I just, I'm, I'm just going through this. I mean, I've studied the Gospel of John in chapter 15 over and over again. And, and uh, I, I got stuff that's online now and stuff like that. But I have, always, I have always torn up my notes or delete them or whatever. I just, I, I, I tend, not with the computer age and stuff like that, I've, I've got them there. But I, 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 I try not to look back at my old notes or anything like that. Because, because if we're going through the Word every five to seven years, it, it, if I can't be infected or affected or write better sermons than I did seven years ago, then I, you know, I don't need to be looking back at that. And, and by going through this, I'm like, it just kind of just popped out of me. It just this time going through is that the fruit doesn't eat itself. The branches bear the fruit, and the branches do what with the fruit? It's for everybody else. So many times we get caught up, and I need the fruit, and we look at Galatians chapter five about the fruit of the spirit. But all the fruit is meant for everybody else. I've never seen a fruit tree eat itself. I've seen it die. I've seen it being cut down and burned. But I've never seen the fruit trees or any of those trees eat itself. It's always meant for somebody else. Maybe that's just for me, but hopefully the, it's for everybody else here. But, but if I'm abiding in Him, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me, and I am him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Now, I can do some things. I can do church, folks. I can do church. 
Uh, church is easy because uh, people are very religious. We like pathological things. I mean, we can do church. I choose not to do that. I choose to do relationship. And here's based on a relationship. And so I'm the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him does what? Bears much fruit. You can't help. You can't help but bear the fruit. If you're in that relationship, you take on, I think, and, and you're that branch, and you're going to bear fruit. And it would be like I learned many years ago. You're going to say, hey, let's go out witnessing. No, we are witnesses. If I'm in a relationship with the Lord, I'm going to act a certain way. I'm going to behave a certain way because of that relationship. You think about it with husbands and wives or uh, work or school or play, uh, uh, whatever gang you're in, you behave a certain way because you're taking on the characteristics of that group, that people, whatever. But the, but the thing here is this, is that how do I look? Now, in the last couple of chapters, what has Jesus been, been talking to you and I about through the Spirit? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me. Love one another. And he's going to continue to go on. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, you will bear much fruit. You know, so many times we look around it, and that's that whole thing is that when people say, well, uh, you know, I see the fruit. When you have to strain with a magnifying glass, I want to make this real clear to you that the worst thing that we can do, I've said this a couple of Thursdays ago, the worst thing that we can do to another believer is convince them that they're bearing fruit. To, to try to talk them into that, you're growing. I see growth and maturity. It, it's either there or it's not. But when we try to like help someone, oh, and make them feel positive, have a positive self-mental image of themselves and stuff like that, when I don't judge anyone's salvation, I'm, I'm under the assumption here, everyone here has a relationship with the Lord that makes you sure you'll go to heaven when you die. I'm under that assumption. You, you come to me otherwise and tell me that differently, but I'm going to talk to you like believers here today. And so here, that you will bear much fruit. And so if a person's not bearing much fruit, well, what does Matthew chapter 7 tell us that we need to look at? I can't judge your salvation, but I can look at you positionally. Okay, you're clean. But then where's the abiding? You see, the fruit just happens. You just can't go out and say, I'm just going to go out and bear fruit. I'm just going to go out and do that. I mean, it, the branch just bears the fruit. If the source is right, and that vine is right, then you'll just bear much fruit. It's just going to happen. You, you, you can't stop it. Took a couple years ago, uh, reminded me, sang one of the songs from Brother Will Waters, who, uh, who's in heaven right now and we're not, but I'll deal with that later. Uh, and took a couple from his church. We went to Israel and stuff. And this is... And they, and I, because we go out at night, when we go to Israel, we don't, we study the Bible during the day and then we have outreach at night for those who want to go out and do outreach with us and people, and I have the Israel means we've got a group coming right now and everyone says the same thing. Well, I'm nervous and I don't know what I'm going to do and what's going to go on. I mean, we give you shirts to wear everything we can do to put you into a conversation. You know, so I just, and I've had people who've, who've never really ever shared their faith here, gone in the street when it's in dumb park reach with us or anything like that. And when they go there, I just video them because it's a crack up. Because you, they just can't be quiet. So again, this one, uh, this, this couple, they were, he was a science teacher. She was a, the lunch lady, and the, but they were farmers. That was their main income was farming. And they just, they don't witness to cows a whole lot. I mean, they're just, they're out there. And they just, and, this, and to see this couple just talking to people at the Sea of Galilee. Do you realize where you live? That's the Sea of Galilee out there. Jesus walked on the wall. How can you not believe you're right here? And I'm just like, wow, just video. Get the video on these people. <laughs> people come to me, I can't believe it, Pastor Chuck. I just, you told me that I would, I just, I just, I just can't. And, and, and to this day, it's almost 10 years ago, to this day, they are fanatics. It took them, listen, all those Bible studies here, but going to Israel and seeing and experiencing it, and now they just can't stop talking about Jesus Christ. They're always telling people about Israel, what they did. They saw it right there. It's right there. You see, that's the whole thing. You're just going to bear fruit because of that relationship. So positionally, we're clean. Hey, folks, you don't abide in Christ. You don't further that relationship. I want you to understand biblically, theologically, you're still going to heaven. Okay? You're still going to heaven. But the thing that you and I, what God tells us, that we're commanded, this is this whole thing that, we're to abide in Christ. And to abide in Him, we will bear much fruit. 
See, it's, it's evident. See, Jesus is leading up these things. If you love me, keep my commandments. Okay. If I, and if you're into checklists, just give yourself a checklist. Keep his commandments. Love him. If I love him, I'll keep his commandments. I'll be doing this thing. And then he gives you other things. In 1 John, how can you say you love God when you hate your brother and sister? How, how can you say that? How, how can you say when you hate anybody? Some people say, well, uh, I love the body of Christ, but I hate the pagan world. Well, that's not how God views it. He hates the sin, but he loves the sinner. We know that. So here, if anyone does not abide in me, look at this. This isn't Chick the fanatic. This isn't just Pastor Chick telling you this. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Some would take this, well, you can lose your salvation. I, I, I don't see it in that. You know, First John tells us that those who have departed from us really go to show that they were never really of us. And I really can't judge anyone's salvation here. But yet the Bible tells me the wheat and the tares are going to go together. There's people who have a soulish experience. There's people who come to church because it's, it's better than some of the other groups they go to. Or the coffee's better here or something like that. I know some people, you know, we went to AA because they had really good coffee there. But understand this is that they can do that. Some people do that. And so the thing that it comes down to here is that there could be, there, there would be people that I thought were, were Christians. Watched one brother and sister who I thought were brother and sister, and she got up in the middle of marriage counseling and says, that's it, I've never accepted Christ, I'm not a Christian, and walked out. Another friend of mine, there they are, marriage counseling, another marriage counseling, or not even a marriage counseling, it was after a Sunday service, and there are the couples are sitting together, and she goes, you know, I'm sick and tired. They already had a baby together, and they, they, they did that whole Christian dating thing that led to Christian premarital sex, that uh, led to missionary marriage and, and uh, evangelism divorce and all that kind of stuff. But there she was, met at a Christian event, and they got too close together. And, and then, well, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to marry her and stuff like that. Here he goes. After, after <laughs> this is a friend of mine. Uh, good friend that we accept the Lord just a couple weeks apart from each other. Here he is, just his son's not even a year old, about nine months old. They're at lunch, after service, after church. And she goes, you know, I'm sick and tired of this whole born-again thing. She goes, you know, I was never really ever a Christian. I only came to the Christian concert so I could find myself a Christian husband because I knew enough of the Bible that even if I'm a non-believer, you can't leave me. He's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> 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 it just and right there and he just he calls me up and he just begins to cry and everything and just, oh man I said bro okay granted you know this wasn't hard to figure out but I mean I, I've seen that but there would be people I mean just because we go to church just because we're hanging out here doesn't mean that everyone's going to be going to heaven but we need to look at the fruit one of the things is the fruit helps us so if there's not much fruit that's being born there, well, I'm not going to ask on the salvation thing. I'm just going to look at here what God says. Look, it's real simple. Are you abiding in Jesus Christ? If you're abiding in Jesus Christ, the fruit will bear. Well, I listen to Bible studies. I hear, I hear that one a lot. I listen to Bible studies. Do you apply anything? I listen to Bible studies. I read the Bible every day. Do you apply it? I read it. Do you know the demons know the will of God? Do you know the demons know the word of God and they shudder? So here's the thing, folks. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever, what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Basic relationship one-on-one. Starting off, wife and I, you know, we... We talk to one another. Well, if you love me, you'll do this. Then we flip around. Well, if you love me, you wouldn't ask. But if you love me, you wouldn't ask me to ask me not ask you. But if you love me, I mean, and all we're trying to do is wait the other one out. Well, I want you to do it first. I always tell my wife, I've been married 23 years. I said, for the next 23 years, let's just do whatever I want. And then 23 years after that, we'll do whatever you want. Does it? I've tried as I may, I've tried as I may, but I'm still the one who always puts the toilet seat down. I have to. I can't get her to lift it up. And it's just never going to change, is it? You see, because of relationship, 
we abide and we do certain things here. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. You can cross-reference this with Jude. Jude says what? To remain in the place of God's love. Because God, he wants to pour out his blessings upon you. You want to be under the spout where the glory comes out. Amen? All right. Hey, women? All right, you want to be under that spot where the glory comes out. You want to remain in that place of love. So in other words, understand abiding. Positionally, I'm clean. I'm set. I'm sealed. I'm his. But now there's this abiding. Yes, I can be out of fellowship. If I can be out of fellowship with brothers and sisters, I can be out of fellowship with the Lord. I need to continue to abide. As the Father loved me, also I have loved you. Abide in my what? My love. My love. You can read the Bible, read the Bible, but if you're not abiding, if the Bible's not in you, you can mark up your Bibles, you can highlight your Bibles, but unless the Bible marks you and highlights you, unless it makes a difference in your life, then they're just words. It's just literature. Great poems, great sayings, great things. Jesus was a great teacher. You can say things like that. But unless because of this abiding, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Why do I struggle with sin? Why do I struggle with this thing? What's happening with that thing? Here's the diagnostic thing. And that's why I'm saying chapter 15 is to believers. To the lost, to the unsaved, this means absolutely nothing to you. There, there, there are no... Some people try to attach or take things from the Bible and try to apply things like these are financial godly principles. I've heard people who, who have, are just heretics. They said, you know, like, if you just practice these seven things, whether you're a Christian or not, you know, God will bless you. Because He has to. He has to. Really. All right, God. I've got you surrounded by your word. I hate your son. I have no desire to be with you in heaven, but I'm doing these seven things. Smuckatelli hair tick, big hair over here has told me that if I do these seven things, it's all based on this relationship. I can ask whatever I want, what my desires are. Well, what are my desires? If I'm spending time with the Lord and His words are abiding me, what am I going to ask for? It's just obvious there. By what I ask for and what I seek for in prayer will reveal my heart. What I'm really about, what my agenda is, and what's happening there, because of from the mouth flows what? The issues of the heart. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Jesus is showing us that He's abiding as well. Oh, well, that's easy. He was God. <laughs> he was God in the flesh. And people say, well, you know, we're human. Well, so was, so was Jesus. And he continued to abide. Yes, he lived a perfect sinless life, and that's why he was able to pay for our, our sins. But anyone here ever crucified? Totally deserted? Maligned? I mean, has anyone been persecuted more than Jesus? He went through it much more so that he could identify with us. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Talked about that last chapter is that that peace. I'm not talking about happiness. Whee! I'm happy. Our Constitution says that we have the guarantee of the right to pursue happiness. But I've read it. It doesn't say we're guaranteed to get it and have it. And so here, when I'm talking about this peace that goes by all understanding and this joy, yeah, there might be feelings of happiness and wee, wee, wee all the way home. But this is a joy. That's deep down. This is a joy that's based in that vine. This is that joy that, well, you can cross-reference this with 1 Corinthians 13. It keeps no record of wrongs. It bears no ill will. It doesn't harbor any resentment. And so here, this is that joy. And this, my love, that, and he says this, that he wants these things that I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Everything I continually read of God's Word is that He's wanting us to be full, complete, not lacking any good thing in His Word. And by abiding in Him, they're all there. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Is that really a hard commandment? My commandment is eat all the candy you want. Can you imagine if I went that to my kids? My commandment to you is just go to sleep whenever you want. My commandment is to you is here's everything. My commandment to you is to just enjoy whatever. And well, what kind of a commandment is that? Sort of like, yeah, my commandment. My commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. 
There's, there's a blessing in loving one another. There's that benefit in one another. But understand this. There's also this commandment that why we need to command to love one another. Do you, do you understand that love is a choice? It's not a feeling. You can get all kinds of feelings. You can get feelings from eating chocolate, and you can get feelings from Brussels sprouts. Their feelings are feelings, all right? They can be chemically and psychosomatically induced in you somehow. But love is a choice. You look at 1 Corinthians 13. Love, again, what does it do? You take the word love out and you put in Jesus and it still fits, right? Here's a tough one. Replace the word love with Jesus, it still fits. Now replace Jesus with our names. No, I'm just going to replace Jesus' name. I'm just, just going to go back there. Do I keep a record of wrongs? Do I bear ill will? Do I, you, you, you personalize it that way. This is my commandment, that you love one another. You choose to love. Here, here's, and it might be hard for some of you to believe. Some of you actually believe this now. Here's my choice. Going and in, in, in serving the Lord because, I, I, again, being frustrated. My pastor having to correct me. Hey, look, bear up with the failings of the week. There's no time limit there and stuff like that. There's something that I decided years ago. I just choose to believe everyone loves me. Yeah? You think that's... But I don't get upset at anybody. And people say, well... They, they, they say, well... And someone says, well, I don't understand why that person did it. My response is, oh, because they love you. Well, that didn't seem real love. Well, the Bible says we're commanded to love one another. So that's obviously why they did it. And I said the same thing. Sometimes when I chunk it up and blow it, and my wife says, why'd you do that? Because I love you. I don't think there was a whole lot of love in that. Well, that's my choice, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, you understand? If, if I say those words, well, because I love you. Well, that wasn't real loving. Hmm. I either need to change the Bible or change me. Hmm. Maybe I can get the erasable Bible. You know, I can just write in my own words right there. Do you, you understand? I, I, I choose to do it. Therefore, I have no hidden agendas. No motives. I just think everyone loves me. Not that, that oh, hey, they love me. You know, everybody loves me. I, I just choose to believe everything that person does just because out of love until you prove otherwise. And so my, my philosophy is that, that love, uh, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt until otherwise proven uh, hateful. All right, so if you abide in my loves. Look at this. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than he lay down one's life for his friends. And, and, you know, my best friend Mike Fernandez really helped me with this one. He says, you know, I just, he says, I just apply the chick principle. And I reverse it. I do the Mike Fernandez principle. If someone asks me something, I just envision Mike Fernandez asking me. Because the Mike Fernandez, oh yeah, I'll be right there. And they're just like that. So if, if you've asked me to do things and I've showed up, I've just envisioned you as Mike Fernandez. Or I, I just I say, because if Mike asked me to do this, I'm going to do it. That's my best friend. People say, well, isn't your wife your best friend? No, because I lie to my best friend. <laughs> my wife's my wife. I can't lie to her. All right? But, but do you understand is that, is that I just say, oh, the whole thing, if, if, if my best friend asked me this, would I do that? And that might... That lets me know, am I loving? Am I doing this? What's my agenda? What's my motive? And so, yes, you can ask me. You can come up to me. Just think of me as Mike and ask me for it. I'll just do that. I also tell Mike no sometimes as well. So be prepared for that. All right? We also wrestle. Be prepared for that. <laughs> Greater love has no one this than that he lays down one's life for his friends. Now we see the greatest example is in Jesus Christ. I... I've told you, my testimony is one, I, I, I desire that if it was Jesus asking me these things. But I have to just, I, I'm not there yet. Right now, uh, the closest I'm getting is my best friend, Mike Fernandez. And so here's that whole thing that I just come down to, is, is that I, I see this in Jesus' life. Greater love has no one, uh, no one of this than when they lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Wow. Sounds like there's some conditions there, Jesus. Well, how are you going to prove it? How are you going to prove your friendship? Your friendship will be proven there. I've seen a couple today, they got sort of matching tattoos. If they don't stay friends, well, one of them is going to be kind of, oh. Huh. And you'll know what kind of their friendship is because they might get it covered up with something else. But... That's commitment to a friendship there. 
But so the thing that happens here is that you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Whatever. We say that in Minnesota, right? Whatever. But here's how to be biblical. Whatever. Whatever you ask me. Whatever. Whatever. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I have made known to you. That is relationship. That is position. There's a position of a servant. And if you're just going to act like a servant, that's the whole thing. But that's the thing is that then you don't know me. You know, many times people try to minister to me. They think the word minister means minister to the minister. And they try to minister to me, but I realize that there's not that friendship there. I need to endeavor to to make sure that they know that we're friends and we're friendly with one another. But Jesus Christ said of himself, I did not come to be ministered unto, but I came to minister. And again, remember, branches, what do we do? We're to bear the fruit. The vine that's in us, that's Jesus Christ, produces the fruit and we're to bear it. And we're to, a little fruit. We like a little fruit there? A little fruit? A little nibble right there? A little finger fruit? I mean, we are to give out that fruit. The fruit tree does not eat itself. That fruit is for everything else. We sometimes think about, I want the fruit. Why? So I can have a better life. I can feel good. I Look, that peace that goes by understanding, that joy that he talks about us for, to have right here, that he wants to be full, all happens because of abiding in Jesus Christ. There is a benefit derived in walking and abiding in Jesus Christ. Peace and joy that he, again, makes full in our lives. He tells them here, no longer do I, again, verse 16, you do not choose me, but I chose uh, you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you these things. I command you that you love one another. Do you understand that Jesus Christ could not say until Judas was gone, you're all clean. Judas had to be gone. It wasn't a mistake. When Judas was there, it says, not all of you are clean. Washed his feet. Ministered to him. But one of you is going to betray me. Judas is gone now. Whatever you do, do quickly. Breaks out. Who's going to betray you? The one who I dipped the bread in, handed it to him. Wow, I wonder what he meant by that. Uh, and then do what he do quickly. And they go. And they just came up with their own perception. Well, he must be going to go prepare more things for the feast. And now Jesus says, you are all clean. You're all clean. Continue to bite in me. But he says, these things I command you that you love one another. You see, if we really did have a problem with low self-esteem, that's what the world tells us, right? That's what some Christian psychobabblers try to tell you. I don't know how that works out, being a Christian and a psychobabbler, but the whole thing is that they try to tell you, you just have low self-esteem. Really? I can tell you experientially, I think way entirely too much of myself. If I, because we're continually taught in the Bible, stop thinking about yourself so much. Philippians chapter 2, think of others. I mean, if, if we really didn't think about ourselves too much, it says, this I command you, love yourself first before you can love somebody else. That's not in the Bible. You first must forgive yourself before you can forgive others. Really? You know, he keeps telling us about this whole thing about love. And I mean that sarcastically. Because it's stupid. It's silly. I think way entirely too much about myself. The four times the word esteem is used in the Bible. Four times! And it's it's always meant to esteem others more than ourselves. Or to esteem the Lord. These things I command you that you love one another. He tells us these things. That's why he tells us in Ephesians and Thessalonians. Stop stealing. Stop lying. Stop cheating. He's talking to the Christians. Stop doing these things. I mean, have we ever once, I have never once told my kids, you know, you are sharing way entirely too much with the other kids. If you always share your toys, you're never going to have any time for yourself. Are you kidding me? Every one of my kids, man, they've seen some kid come to their toy box and pull out a toy they haven't seen in a year, and all of a sudden, my! <laughs> Had one kid grab it and bam, knock a kid out. I. I've, I've never told any of my kids. And no one's ever told me, Chick, you, sh- you just share way too much. You know what we are told? Especially if you're serving the Lord. You know, too much of a good thing can hurt you. Too much of Jesus can hurt me. You know, you're so heavenly minded, you know, earthly good. What is someone trying to say with that? I, I've, I, I just want to be in heaven. That's where I want to be. 
And, and, and people try to say things. Oh, well, you know what? You just need to slow down. What would it sound like if we went to the people who are just basically nothing? I mean, bearing no fruit. We walked to them and said, you know, the reason why you have so much energy uh, to spend on yourself is that, you know, you really don't serve the Lord. Wouldn't we sound kind of arrogant and condescending? But why is it okay for the world or even the Christians to come to us and say, you know, you're really serving the Lord too much. You're really way into that. Hey, come and follow me. Come, come with me last week when I see someone who's hung themselves and I have to deal with their, their widow and their, their spouse. Come with me as I go to the hospital rooms and I, and I see people at the end of their lives. I've literally seen close to 500 people die. And none of them have ever wished that they spent more time at the office. And especially the Christians. All of them said, I wish I would have spent more time serving the Lord. Even the world has some ideas. Maybe you know Irma Bombeck, you know, the grass is greener on the other side and all that kind of stuff. And even this pagan, even this, I don't know if she was a nominal Christian or not, but even when she found out she had cancer, writes this great obituary. I wish I, I would have loved more. I would have done these things more. I would have let these things go. I would have done all these things differently. I would have spent all the time. Watched a movie where the guy's mourning over the death of his wife and his kids because the last words that he said to him, they were arguing over kitchen things or something like that. Even the world has movies like that that knows that that could be the regret, the last words that you could say can affect you. We're commanded, folks, these things I command you, that you love one another. But here's the price that you will pay. And this is where the love stops. Verse 18, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. The world doesn't want you to love. The world doesn't want you to love. Man, I had a boss yelling and screaming at me one time, and just he just just and he started cursing and started using. I mean, he thought he was he thought he was all something, and all his other buddies are around him, and he starts and he just starts using the God's name really in vain and all kinds of foul words. Even his buddies started moving away, looking up. You know, like this lightning is just going to strike. He goes, "Yeah, I guess I told him." Hey, hey where is everyone? They're like, "Oh, hey, uh, you know." In case God's aim's off a little bit, we want to make sure you're... Even the world knew that. Oh man, and I wanted to beat him for Jesus. I wanted to hurt him and pray for a healing. And I looked at him and I said... And I talk about... It was just one of those, it was just one of those particular times in the Spirit. I was praying. This thing came out of nowhere. It was an attack of the enemy. I can understand this guy just all of a sudden. And I just realized what it was. And this is where this all started, if you've ever heard me make this statement. This is where it started, you know, 28 years ago. And I just looked at him, and these were not the words I was thinking, but I know it was the Holy Spirit. Give me understand. I said, oh, yeah, well, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Everyone just kind of looks around. I got I to gotta paint the scene. I was a Marine. Saying that to my staff sergeant. They're all just kind of, and all his buddies are going, I, I, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> and I was like, hey, hey, hey. got me another weapon. <laughs> and then I just started going, I said, well, I'm going to use this one. I was like, hey, and I love you. Because you got to play it off, man. You just can't look, I just love this one guy, and I love you, and I love you. And this is where it all started, folks. 28 years ago, that's right, bless you, go to heaven, one way, that's right, in Jesus' name, I love you, I love you, and they're all like, and I'm walking around with this bravado, and everyone's like, hey, get, get away from me, <laughs> hey man, can't we just all get along, I love you, in Jesus' name, and all, man, they just want anything, they were afraid of me, they weren't afraid of me like a homosexual, he's going to hug me type of way, they were afraid of me because of the, because of the love of God, and I discovered Within my first couple of years of my walk with the Lord, the power of God's love. If I just, if I just choose anyone who loves me and I just respond in love, which I haven't always done. Remember, I'm just telling the story where I'm a hero. <laughs> but understand this is that, is that the power of God's love, man, just rocks. And I have tried over the years, 29 years of being a Christian, to get in fights. And God just won't let it happen. Things just happen. Like, bless you. That's right. Go to heaven. One way. I love you in Jesus' name. There's nothing you can do about it. And there really isn't. What's the comeback for that? Oh, yeah, well, they're just there. And then you just top it off. They start going, oh, really? Well, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Bam! They just, there's no comeback for that. 
Let's terrorize them with the love of God. It's fun. It is. <laughs> Have that love of God in you. And you say, these things I command you that you love one another. I love that commandment. Not just the body of God. I just love it. I love you and I love you and I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. And then when they have things to say about you, they're like, well, you know, he does love us. I've had co-workers get together and said, they, I, I've overheard him in the break room plotting my demise. And finally someone, someone just says, well, you know, he's just going to say he loves you. Yeah, yeah, I hate when he says that. I hate when he says that. <laughs> and I walk by the break room. I love you. Go! <laughs> the love of God is fun. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. They're hating Jesus, folks. They're hating the Jesus, the vine, the love that is in you. They have no comeback for that. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. It does. If, and I want you to understand something. If you're on a road and you're like uh, shoulder to shoulder with people and you're all laughing and having a good time, you're on the wrong road. You're on the wrong road. And if you're in a place where just everyone, I'm not saying just be persecuted for weirdness sake, but if everyone just loves you for the sake of love and you're not getting along, then you're of the world. You can be positionally clean in Christ, but you're not abiding in Christ and you're abiding in the world. And here's the cost. It's going to hate you. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're also going to persecute you. If they, uh, if they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my namesake, because they do not know him who sent me. He who hates me hates my father also. If I have not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that would might be fulfilled, which is written in the law. In their law, they hated me without a cause. They hated me without a cause. This is the thing that he gives to you and I, folks. I think that's in Psalm 69, 4. They hated me without a cause. This is the Lord. There is no cause. There's not going to be a cause. Why do they hate me? Why are they doing these things? There's no reason. There's no rhyme or reason. Because it's Jesus that's in you. They might be polite and might be cordial to you at times, but understand this, is that with that love that you have, you can just go out and you are armed with the greatest arsenal and tool whatsoever. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, He will testify of me. And you also will bear, uh, bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So from the beginning of your relationship with the Lord, have you abided with Him? They're going to know these things. The Spirit's going to bear witness with it. It's, and it's the greatest the thing that it says that when you meet another believer, <clears throat> there's that, you don't even know Him. But the Spirit is bearing witness. There's some times that, uh, that I'll be on an elevator or something, something like that, and there's just like, wow. And I go, I look at them, and I don't ask if you're a Christian. I just say, hey, you're a believer. You a believer? I'm a believer. And they're like, well, yes, I am. And we just, the Christian needs just comes out. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love hot dish. Uh, all these things come out. I mean, this is wonderful. And, and then the people that I'm with are like, did, did you know them? No. I took a, an unbeliever with me back east. So I have the guy I've been witnessing to for years, and we flew back east. He's another pilot, and meeting a, another Christian that I, we've only met online. We, another Calvary pastor, we only know each other from the internet. Uh, we've never seen each other at conferences, and he's going to come to Israel with us. So I went out there to do meetings for him and his group and some others, and I, I took this guy with me, and, and I said, well, the price of mission is you, wherever we're sleeping, you know, you got to sleep there with it. I mean, we're just, we might be in homes, we might be in hotels, but, you know, we're going. He's like, I'll do whatever. I mean, I'm going to go fly. We flew up to New York and up to New England, all this kind of stuff. He's, yeah, I'll do that. I'll put up with that. And then we meet, we're the first place we go, we meet this guy. It's the first time I ever met this guy face to face. And man, he goes in the house to get us some lemonade. We're just hanging out there. It's really humid and we're swimming in the guy's pool. And, and the guy asked me, he says, man, how long have you guys been friends? I said, it's the first time we've ever met. What? Yeah, it's the first time we've ever met. I mean, we've known each other. We've talked online. We've Talked on the phone, we've emailed back and forth, and we just kind of know each other from some of the same people. But it's the first time we ever visited him. He's like, I don't get that. I mean, it's like you guys have known each other your lives. Well, we've known the same Savior, and He's known us all our lives, and that's what bear witness. And I began to say, that's the love of God. Well, the thing was, is that He was with me for three days, and He got to see that over and over and over again. It affected Him so much, He didn't talk to me for about eight months. And I went to some places and I filled in the pulpit and, I, and he never heard me 
speak or teach, and I was filling in this uh, rather large Calvary back east, a few thousand people, and I'm speaking to these crowds and doing some stuff. Pastor friend had me fill in for him, and he just, I, I didn't know you could do that. I knew you were a talker, but he's like, and people actually listen to you. <laughs> hey, man, I'm more amazed than you. <laughs> All right? You should come to church on Sunday. These people keep showing up. It's on them. And he just begins to open up and share a little bit. And, 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 but I don't, I don't hear from him about eight, nine months. And then I meet up with him and his family at some uh, event. And I guess he'd been talking about me. He goes, oh, I heard you're quite the little preacher boy. That's the family. I'm like, well, I'm not that little, but okay. And just be, and just be sharing. And, and that, that so affects him. You see, I really thought... And this is where I'll leave you today. I really thought that he would go around and he would hear because I was going to be speaking places and witnessing about Jesus Christ and all like that. And I really had it in my mind that I was intellectually going to, I mean, gave all the arguments, everything there, spoke, taught, did all these things. <laughs> and that which I thought would, that I waxed so eloquently and he would be so indebted to these words of wisdom and pearls of God's word. The thing that affected him the most is that you hooked up with people you've never met before, but it's been like you've known each other your whole lives. And he goes, I can't describe it, but I'm beginning to believe this thing about love you keep talking about. That's it? Yeah. So I would just encourage you folks, the love of God. Sometimes we forget about it. Sometimes we get on the intellectual pursuit. Sometimes we've got Bible studies just flowing out our ears, man. And we just got everything going. We've got the Bible. We know all this stuff like that. But even after all these years and being caught up in the business of the ministry... I can tell you that sometimes I too can forget about the love of God. And sometimes it can be so natural to me because I just love everybody. I don't even think about it. I just, I breathe. I just, I just choose to believe everyone loves me and I just function that way. I, it's, it's not even something I'm even commanded to do anymore. You just know you're going to hear, hey, well, you're here now. Hey, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just, it's so pathological in my life. That's, it's just there that sometimes I forget about how powerful it is and I could spend a few days with someone who's never been exposed to it and see it and walks away with it. And I can tell you, it's true, folks. They'll know we are Christians by our love. So if after today, and this is what it is that I encourage you, if you need to take the commandments of God and you have to choose and you need to listen to God and you're commanded to love one another, after a while I can tell you, it won't even be a commandment. It'll just be your life and who you are.